I have a, in my talk, I'm going to cover uh, two topics, right? The first one, I'm going to introduce our recent work on zigzag antiferromagnet. And what's interesting in this study is uh, we, we can observe excitons first, and uh, this exciton actually strong coupled to these uh, zigzag antiferromagnet order, and uh, you can introduce these optical anisotropies, and uh, we can study how it's coupling to uh, phonons. And the second part of my talk, I'm going to introduce a we observe the observation of a ferromagnetism in twisted one plus two graphene systems. Okay, so the first part work on zigzag antiferromagnet is mainly done by my graduate student Cal Hombo and also my former postdoc Chi Zhang. Now he's actually a professor at the Nanjing University. And uh, for this project, we have a, a crystal grown at UW by Jing Hao and uh, his student Chen Yi. And uh, I, there's a quite a few activities we have right now working on these crystals. So we have electron diffractions and you know, collaboration with Hai Dan Wen, Neil Gaddick, and uh, Alfred at MIT. And from the theory side, we have collaboration with Di Xiao and his postdoc Chong Wang, and also Wang Yao and uh, Wang Yun at uh, HKU. For today's part, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna cover the electron diffraction part, but that's a, we also saw a lot of interesting things there. So in the graphing side, actually, it's a collaboration between my colleague, Matt Yankovic, and also Corey Dean at the Columbia. Basically, it's an equal, equal contribution from three groups. And the measurements is mainly done by Xiao Wen Chen at Columbia, and also my student, Ming Hao He at the UW. So let me start with the zigzag antifire magnet. And the motivation for, for doing this work is, uh, we all know, right, that like, uh, Justin was you know, saying, my, my I have a lot of research activities on excitons, and uh, we know that uh, for two-dimensional systems, most of, basically all the system we have is non-magnetic. And uh, now we start to have these uh, um, magnet semiconductors, so there's a possibility to 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 have excitons in such system, then study magneto excitons. So this will be something new and uh, not being done before. So that's sort of motivation to begin with. Then once we have that, right, we can always uh, uh, go back to redo the exciton physics, but the coupling do these many orders, such as electrical controls, right, make heterostructures, structures, use string, string engineering, and do Mori pattern, Mori engineering, et cetera. The other part is uh, because if we can have these magnetic semiconductor, we can always use optical ways to control the exciton the spin the system, so for optical spintronics. And the, the material can I mainly talk about today is uh, uh, transition metal phosphorus tricotinite. So it's MPX3. M is a transition metal, can be nickel or manganese, and it can be iron too, okay? And X is can be sulfur and selenite. So the, the, there's a table here. And uh, in such a system, another thing we are in, interested in is uh, uh, to study the strong correlations between the spin degree freedom, lattice degree freedom, and the electronic degree freedom. So one example, you know, sort of motivation is uh, uh, for one of the materials like iron phosphor tricyclinate, and it, it starts with a zigzag antiferromagnet, and uh, under high pressures, all right, and it can actually become a superconductor. That's a sort of phase transition driven by these uh, um, pressure. So, so, so it's kind of interesting, right? You can start with a, a, a magnetic system and uh, as, uh, under certain conditions become a supernatic. So, so there's a uh, interesting physics we can study here too. And let me just talk a little bit about the, the uh, what's the magnetic interactions in honeycomb lattice, right? In two dimensions, most uh, magnets we have is has these honeycomb structures. So the honeycomb lattice for these magnetic interactions can be described by these uh, Heisenberg models. And we have uh, three terms here. And SI is electron spins in the ith lattice sites. And we have this J1, J2, and the J3 slate, uh, three terms. And uh, this J1, J2, J3, it, it describes the exchange interactions, right? J1 is uh, for first nearest neighbor. So, you know, from this green to these orange dots. And J2 is the second uh, nearest neighbor. So it means uh, you know, from these green dots to these orange dots, and J3 is the uh, third and nearest neighbors. So the mag magnet order is really depends on the, uh, the strength of this J1, J2, J3. For example, even though you know, J3 is becomes the atoms with a largest distance, but the, if we have a atom in the middle here, for example, in the center of this hexagonal lattice, right? Then the super exchange interaction actually can make J3 is larger than J, J2, right? 
So here's a sort of uh, phase diagram calculated by D. Xiao a few years ago, and to consider the ratio of J1 of J3 and the J2 of J3. So it depends on these ratios. We can have this uh, magnetic phase diagram, you know, at this bottom left corner, it can be a ferromagnet. So for example, like chrome, germanium, terrorized ring, we know it's a ferromagnet semiconductor, it's actually here, right? And for crystals like a manganese phosphate trisulfide, um, manganese phosphate trisulfide is actually on the bottom right corner. It's become a new order. So new order means uh, means that the electron spin in the adjacent site is pointing to opposite directions. Okay, so it's a new order. And uh, what's interesting is that in the middle here, the green area, right? The green area is a zigzag order. So for the zigzag, you know, as I draw here, right? And it means a zigzag directions. The spin is pointing to the same directions, but the photo, so it's a ferromagnetic order, right? In a zigzag directions, but the adjacent is zigzag. The spin actually pointing to opposite directions. So it's called zigzag antiferromagnet. And then this other corner, you can also have a stripe stripe order. So stripe order means you know it's an armchair direction, right? It's a ferromagnet, but adjacent armchair direction is a, is a antifer antiferromagnet aligned. Okay. And for what we're gonna talk about today, right? You know, as I said, there's a three, there's a you know, uh, transition metal, right? Phosphor tricotinides, and uh, they can be at the three different places, right here and here and here. So for iron phosphor trisulfide and the nickel phosphor trisulfide, they belong to these zigzag order, but the polar magnets belong to these uh, new order. So, so for these three material systems, and I, I'm gonna focus on the one in the middle, but just uh, as a background, right? For iron phosphor trisulfide, it's a zigzag AFN with a new temperature 120 Kelvin. It's belonged to a 2D icing. So actually, Chihua, right? Chihua's group is the first one demonstrating you know, this uh, monolayer 2D icing zigzag anti magnet in this iron phosphor trisulfide is uh, uh, Raman measurements a few years ago. And the uh, nickel phosphor trisulfide is also zigzag and different order, but uh, it becomes two dimensional anisotropic Hasenberg, okay, with near temperature 150 Kelvin. Then the last one is magnesium phosphor trisulfide, it's a 2D Hasenberg model. Its near temperature is uh, uh, 80 Kelvin. <clears throat> nickel phosphor trisulfide, you know, this material system has been studied by a few groups. We're not the first one actually doing it. Just a reminder, right? It has this zigzag antiferromagnetic order, right? It's being you know, zigzag direction. It's a ferromagnetic mag magnetically aligned, and uh, the interlayer coupling is actually it's a ferromagnetic. Then, by bulk crystal, you know, people can study its magnetic susceptibilities, and you can tell the new temperatures about the 150 kelvins. But people also study the the optical conductivities of nickel phosphor trisulfide. And uh, what they do here is basically study these optical conductivity as function temperature. And you can see these uh, uh, oscillator strength transfer from one, you know, one feature to the, the other feature. So uh, forget about details, right? The take home message is that there's a pretty strong coupling between these uh, electronic degree of freedom and also magnetic degree of freedom in these bulk crystals. So what they confirm is, uh, you know, the this nickel phosphor trisulfide actually it's a charge transfer anti ferromagnet insulator. Okay. And uh, a Raman study also being uh, used to, to understand the magnet order. And uh, here I just show the Raman measurements as function of layer thickness. And they found a particular mode and they look at the energy difference of this mode. You can find out that actually it's track these uh, uh, magnetic susceptibilities. So what's interesting in this study is they show there's a, uh, it's a platform basically to study these uh, magnetism in low dimensions. There's a BKT transition of the XY model. Basically in the, in the, in the you know, low dimensions become XY, but in the, in the thick sample, it become XYZ model. And in the model layer, there's no magnet order. Okay. So here's the background. And what we do, you know, we, uh, my group actually looks like excitons, right? So one technique we do study excitons, we look at the, we look for photoluminescence. So basically we tried the many crystals. This is not the first one we tried and we, 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 we got lucky for this particular compound, nickel phosphor trisulfide. And here I show you optical um, microscope image of the sample. And then when I shine laser on this uh, thin bulk, right? I, we just got lucky. We see these very pronounced uh, uh, photoluminescence from the exciton come out. 
and the well, the energy is about the 840 nanometer. So what's interesting is uh, the language is quite narrow actually, is uh, about uh, 350 microEV, right? If you study excitons, if you do optical spectroscopy, you, you're gonna, I think you'll be impressed, right? Because it's a very, very narrow language. <clears throat> So just for comparison, we know for translation metal dichrogenized 2D semiconductors. So here's the state of the art measurements on these MYS2 with a length with about 4.5 milliEVs. And if you go MYC2 or WSC2, the length can go between one and two milliEVs. But here, you know, without it doing any hard work, we already got this, this uh, uh, nickel phosphate trisulfide with a length with about the 350 microEV. And this language is also comparable to the state-of-the-art, you know, guiding assay and quantum well systems. And the, the other interesting thing is, uh, as I show, right, there's two colors here. Right? The red color means uh, vertical polarizations, and the blue it means horizontals. So I do polarization resolve the uh, photoluminescence measurements, and you can already see this. The, the, the luminescence is actually highly non linearly polarized, right? Means that there's a strong optical NSHP in the system. So just to give you background, uh, when I say vertical and horizontal, actually they are not random, right? Vertical means it's along these B axis and horizontal means along these zigzag directions. So what it means is the optical NSHP actually is strongly locked to these uh, zigzag Direction, right? So, I already give you a first indication. These uh, uh, optical anisotropy is coming from these uh, zigzag antiferon order. So it's a measure of these magnetic uh, order. And uh, we we can perform temperature dependent measurements. So here is just uh, the measure right luminescence function temperature go all the way above neo temperature. Neo temperature is 150 Kelvin. So you can just see two things, right? The first is well, the intensity just go quickly drops and uh, approach neo temperature. And the second thing is you will see the length become much broader above a hundred Kelvin. So this might, might be relevant to the enhanced spin fluctuations. So which broaden the length of the exciton. So, that, you know, this is speculation, it's not a hard proof. But the, uh, let's say one quantity actually we can extract, which is uh, the degree of linear polarization. We define as a PO intensity difference between the vertical and the horizontal polarization and the normalized by the sum. Now we look at degree polarization, right? It has these very strong temperature dependence and actually track these new temperatures. So this already a uh, strong indication is a degree of polarization is a measure of some kind of a symmetry breaking uh, order in these systems. And to prove that, we take another step forward. So, and from, for example, like this paper, right? They already measure the magnetic susceptibilities uh, in these, uh, Along these a axis and b axis again, right? A axis in the in the zigzag directions and b axis is in is uh, orthogonal to these zigzag. So basically, measure these uh, uh, in plane magnetic susceptibilities along these a axis and the b axis as function temperatures. Okay. Then if you take a difference of these two, that's what we did. You know, we we, we extract the data from this paper, and we take the difference of these two. So we got this curve. So basically, this is a magnetic susceptibility and a sotries. This is a quantity measure the symmetry breaking order in such a system, okay? Right, the symmetry breaking is here is due to the zigzag anti order. Now I plot my degree of polarization as well in temperature and overlay with these uh, uh, in-plane magnetic susceptibility difference. You can see they match other pretty well, right? So this actually quite remarkable. Basically give us a, a way to measure the optical way, you know, to measure these free atomic thing sample, right? And the, the 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 symmetry breaking order in such a, a magnetic systems. So so I think it's quite exciting. So we have a these uh, exciton systems, and these exciton are strongly coupled to the zigzag anti order, and we use that to measure these uh, uh, the 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 other parameter basically. Okay. Well, and uh, it turns out we are the only not not the only one thinking about this. You know, there's a paper and post on archive, and. Uh, they basically observe these uh, uh, very sharp external distance to uh, in this system, and uh, the language is also on the other 350 microEVs. Yeah, so I would say I'm happy because it's a it's a right it's a repeat, repeatable, so it's not a fluke. And they also measure the degree of polarization as from the temperature. They see it drops. Okay, like we observe. I mean, 
you know, our data is slightly better, but the, the, the physics are the same. Then there's, a, there's another paper that uh, just came out in Nature. Then they also study these uh, excitons. So they study the excitons function temperatures. I'm gonna talk about, uh, as function of uh, layer thickness, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. And they also study peak width example, for example. But the, the interpretation is, uh, uh, is uh, quite interesting. And uh, they claim this exciton is a coherent many body states, okay? And uh, in, in, specific, in, in specific, what they claim here is uh, the exciton is a manifestation actually from a John Wright singular state. Yeah, John Wright singular state is uh, like, this is what uh, proposed by John and the Rice, right? To, to uh, understand these uh, in, in the ground state of uh, uh, cuprates, for example. So, so this paper they present some evidence say this exciton is coming from these uh, coherent many body states. And uh, to, to be honest, actually, I'm not fully understand uh, you know this paper, but it, I, the the home take home message is this state actually quite interesting, and uh, you you can check out this paper if you if you want to know more. Okay, so let me go back to you know take a step forward to look at, to study these uh, uh, luminescence as function layer thickness. So here is a spatial map, right? Photoluminescence intensity map as function of layer thickness. And just by looking at uh, this plot, you will see, well, the intensity drops tremendously, right? From the seven layer all the way to two layer. Two layer basically looks like dark, nothing here. So if I if I just extract the, this appear spectra as function of layer thickness, and uh, this couple of things stands out. The first is intensity drop real quick as function of layer thickness, especially from three layer to two layers there's a, an order of magnitude change, right, from two to three. The second thing is the length of these two layer also broadened dramatically compared to these three layer, right? So there's something happening between two to three, of course, right? From five to four to three, there's something happened too, but not as dramatic as from three to two. And then you go to one layer, everything is gone. So you, we don't see anything. And that can extract the you know the peak position as function of uh, layer thickness. You will see there's uh, there's a blue shift, okay. And uh, so the summary is where right, there's no PO signal from the, 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 in a monolayer, and uh, because of these uh, these are very large intensity uh, suppression from the three layer to layer and, and also to one layer, so this indication of actually a band gap transitions from thin block to a monolayer limit. And uh, another important take home message, what we have here is, uh, right? I see these uh, layer thickness dependent feature for the S-town, right? There's a two, you know, thing. One is the energy of this S-town, the other is intensity and length of this S-town. Because the see, layer thickness dependence, it suggesting this S-town wave function is not highly localized. Otherwise, it cannot follow, right? It cannot follow the, this layer thickness if the S-town wave function is uh, localized in one unit cells. So this suggests the x actually has some kind of one year like features, which is important if you want to, you know, utilize this x say so you do these uh, head of structure engineering, right? And uh, uh, again, right, you know, this system is highly interesting because lots of people already started to look at. So here's this example of, uh, um, of, a, of uh, these two authors, they studied uh, the uh, electronic structure as function of uh, their thickness, and uh, there's some interesting predictions here. How these uh, uh, electronic structure evolve as function of uh, the, the thickness. So our calculation done by Wang Yao and uh, Yong Wang actually quite similar to that paper, but here I just want to show you the main results of the calculation. So indeed, there's a layer thickness dependent electronic structure based on these uh, first principle calculation. In the model layer, you will see the conduction band minimum here is the valence band minimum maximum actually is here. So we will see there's very large right momentum difference you know in the conduction band the minimum and the valence band maximum. So this is a highly indirect exciton. That's a reason we why we don't see any exciton luminescence in the model limit. So what's interesting is that now you go to bilayer, right? Pay attention to this point. Now you will see the energy of these band lowers down a little bit. Okay, and this band is a little closer to the value band maximum. So, well, it's still indirect, but it becomes less indirect, right, compared to a bilayer. Now, that's the reason we start to see the luminescence. And if you go trilayer and the four layer, five layer, et cetera, and this point actually becomes a lowest energy in the systems, 
So the system is still indirect, but it's less indirect compared to this one layer and the two layer case. That's why we do see stronger luminescence in, 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 the thing, in a thick sample like three, four, five layer, et cetera. So, so this system has uh, these uh, layer you know, thickness dependent electronic structures. And again, I emphasize, right, this exciton can actually tell this difference. So it means it, it is, has wave functions of delocalized. And we can study these uh, uh, exciton physics in, in thin samples. Here, just show you an example like five layer. Basically, the message I want to show you is five layer just look like the, the exciton luminescence I show you in a thin box. They have pretty strong, you know, linear precisions. And uh, the degree of polarization also follow these temperatures, et cetera. Okay, so with that, right? And uh, again, uh, we show the system has pretty strong um, optical and such piece. Now what I'm gonna show you is uh, in, in, in addition to this luminescence study, we also study the optical reflections, but also as function of uh, uh, polarization. So again, right, we remind you these two axes. A axis is a horizontal and the B axis is vertical. And the, I shine my light with a horizontal polarization on vertical directions. Then I look at the difference of that, right? So these are called linear decrease measurements, right? If a system has these uh, strong optical and such speed, then we should be able to see linear decrease. So that's exactly what we uh, measured. So here I, I, I show you three linear decrease on three different crystals. So the blue one is a linear decrease in measurements on nickel phosphor trisulfide, and uh, it's consistent with what I described to you, right? Because, because the zigzag anti ferromagnetic order breaks these rotation symmetry, right? Introduce the, you know, these uh, symmetry, uh, kind of uh, introduce these uh, symmetry breaking order parameter. Then, then we, we show these a uh, very strong linear decrease, okay? Then the red dots is coming from iron phosphor trisulfide. And again, we also see very strong uh, linear decrease because iron phosphor trisulfide, as I mentioned at the beginning, right? It's also zigzag anti ferromagnetic order. So zigzag anti ferromagnetic order basically break these uh, rotation symmetries and they introduce these uh, uh, linear decrease. Now, interesting case is for these uh, manganese phosphor trisulfide. If you still remember what I mentioned to you, right? Manganese phosphor trisulfide is uh, it's a new order. So near order is like I show you here, you know, the, the spin in the adjacent uh, uh, sites are pointing to opposite directions. So this near order doesn't break rotation symmetries. Therefore, we don't observe these linear decreases. Right? So this plot of it is shown very clearly, you know, linear decreases is coming from this zigzag anti model as I show you. <coughs> and we can also um, look at the temperature dependence of such systems and apply it as function of temperature, then we can fit it with uh, these, uh, we can extract the critical parameter by fitting these, um, with these uh, functions. So we got in uh, is a uh, critical exponent for iron phosphor trisulfide is about uh, 0.14, which agree with 2D IC model. And uh, then for nickel phosphor trisulfide, where this critical exponent is about uh, 0 0.69, 0 Three six actually, it's closer close to these three D Heisenberg models. Okay, so everything kind of consistent with itself. And uh, again, right, that all shows we can actually measure these linear decrease and uh, to probe these zigzag anti magnet order in in these uh, type of systems. And I think the 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 meaning of what I you know the meaning of these measurements what I show you here is much bigger than just measuring the zigzag anti ferromagnetic order. So, so basically this linear decrease in measurements actually, it's a powerful technique to measure any optical and such be coming from these symmetry breaking order parameters, okay? And for example, you know, very recently, and the like Kim Van Mac and the Jay Shang, the other Cornell, they use this method actually to measure these uh, uh, optical and such be induced by charge order, right? The, the stripe charge order in, in, in twisted the um, WS2 and the WSE2 systems, right? In that case, you know, charge order is coming from these Mori patterns, but they can also probably use a stripe charge order from, from such measurement. And uh, this measurement, for example, we also use in, in our own lab to measure some kind of a, a stripe order in superconductivity. actually, it works. You know, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but I just want to tell you, this technique is uh, quite powerful. All right, now we, we can also perform spectroscopy using this linear decrease, as I show here. And uh, these basically, what I show you here is, uh, is a linear decrease as a function of uh, photon energies, 
And you can see there's many features here. So compared to the paper and the results I showed you at the beginning, right, they measure these optical conductivities of a bulk crystal as function of photon energy. So you see these A peak, B peak, et cetera. So basically this A peak is corresponding to these uh, linear decreasing peak I show here, right? So linear, linear decreasing is kind of enhanced, you know, by these uh, isotonic resonance, right? But there's a lot of features here, a lot of energy, right? There's a lot of features here, here, okay? Corresponding to the features here. So let's zoom in at these, uh, you know, let's zoom in at this spectra, right? And you will see there's, first of all, there's a narrow spike. This narrow spike is corresponding to these uh, acetone resonance that we, I just showed you in this uh, photoluminescence measurement. But there's a, for interesting, there's a lot of wiggles on top, right? At the handy side, there's a lot of wiggles here. So what are these wiggles, you know? They're sitting on the background here, basically. And these wiggles, you were not able to see it in just measure these uh, uh, reflection measurements like show you in this paper, right? If you just measure reflectivity absorption, you're not gonna see these wiggles. It's very smooth background. These wiggles can only be resolved when we measure these linear decreasing. Because linear decreasing is, you can think of it as kind of a, it's a contrast measurements, right? I measure horizontal vertical and, did, and then I take a difference. So these contrast measurements can tell us these fine features in the system. So what are these wiggles? Well, if you believe me, and um, probably you can tell, right? They they already appear. They can kind of appear periodic in terms of energies. So you take a Fourier transform, and uh, the energy is about twenty eight micro eV actually. Sorry, twenty eight milli eV. Well, and then, then you you already you probably already make a guess, right? It should be four months. So, so already give me indication. What I see here is actually is an axon phonon coupling. So it's basically it's an axon phonon bond state. And then, well, which phonon? Let's go back to the phonon spectra, right? That's what we measure, you know, in a system, there's a many phonons here. So there's no phonon at the 28 milliEV, okay? But we found a phonon which is close to this 28 with the 32 milliEV. 32 milliEV corresponding to these uh, outplaying brazier modes, as I show here. You know, the, 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 the nickel atom doesn't move, but the, the sulfur atom is moving up and down, right? Going out of the plane, so it's like breathing. So why is 28, not 32 then? Well, it turns out when I go to check literature, it turns out, you know, this axon phonon bond state, it's a new quasi particle. Of course, it's new when back to 1968, right? It's not new anymore now, but, uh, but it's axon phonon bond state. So, so, People actually already calculated for these axon phonon bound state. You know, they, they, what they show is, right, the binding energy of these axon phonon bound state it should be about 10% of the corresponding phonons. So basically, what it means is, the energy difference between the axon and the phonon should be about 10% uh, less of these phonon energies. So now we look at the phonon energy, right? It's, tw it's 28 milliEV. It's about 10% less than 32, right? Okay, so everything makes sense. So what we have here, so, so, so now the next question is why I have a such strong axon phonon bond state, right? You know, look at it, right? I have so many modes here. So the, what, what I understand is uh, right, when you see these uh, uh, sulfide you know, move, move up and down, so what they happen is actually they change the bond length, right, of these ligand field transitions. So when they change this bond length, basically you change the charge transfer energies, and this directly coupled to these uh, uh, magnetic order in these, uh, you know, the spin is coming from these uh, nickel atom in the middle, right? So, so what it means is that these phonon, these outplaying modes, will strongly change the charge transfer energies then coupled to these magnetic order. So there's a very strong lattice and also magnetic order couplings in such a system. So that's a couple of things new, right? The first is this coupling is quite strong. We see very clear uh, axon phonon bond state, more than 10 manifolds. The second is we can observe these axon phonon coupling all the way to very clearly to a three layer. And there's a little bit in the bi layer, but they're not very clear. And we don't see anything in the model layer, okay? But it's already new. We can see these axon phonon bond state in, in the atomic thing limit. The, the other new, what we observe is, uh, you know, not reported before is this axon phonon bond state actually strongly coupled to this ma magnetic order. So here I show you the uh, linear decreasing intensity plot as function temperature in this vertical axis and also energy in this horizontal axis, okay? So clearly, right, this blue line here, just the axon I showed you, and uh, these uh, fringe, you know, what these uh, little the period I show you is axon phonon bond states and they disappear above these near temperatures.
do you, do you see these um these wiggles um red detuned as well or do you only see them blue that's right yeah red detuned the, the high temperature because uh, the bind, the binding become weak yeah but it seems like you only see them at higher uh, at energies more than um 1.475 right so these wiggles seem to be more pronounced at 1 1.6 1 1.7 UV. Yeah, and, and do, you, right. do you have anything? Do you, do you have anything that's below one point four? So one point four, we we see we can see some weak feature, but it has nothing to do with uh, this type of phone here. Yeah. So so there's a reason you have a very good eye. Actually, yeah, you should do experiments, Justin. <laughs> so, right, you look at this feature here. Basically, like Justin just described, right, the phonon becomes stronger. Not phonon. Okay, I would say the wiggles become stronger. Now, now, you know, if you understand a little bit from now, you will ask me, right, they have other uh, coupling, why they're stronger compared to these low energy features, right? You will think the first order should be stronger than, than my 10th order, right? And uh, that should be correct in terms of if you look at the, the amplitude absorption itself. But what I'm measuring here is a linear dichroism. It's not absorption. So linear dichroism is coming from these uh, anisotropy, right? So anisotropy, of course, is coming from these, you know, is asymmetry, these phonon motions. So, of course, the anisotropy was stronger in, if you involve more phonons, right? Because of the deformation is stronger. Make sense, right? You ten orders phonon this deformation should be stronger than your first order. Then, then your anisotropy should be stronger. So, because what that's what I'm measuring here. Yeah. So, so also a question: uh, Why why does it pick this particular phonon? So. So yeah. Why, yeah, that's what I'm trying to explain here. So this phonon is directly modulated to the charge transfer energy here from the sulfide to these uh, nickel because the the, the 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 bands I'm looking at is a is a the the the, con, the valence band is dominated by the hybrid of a p orbitals from the sulfide and the uh, the conduction band is dominated by d orbital of nickel. Right, because I measure this interband transition from P orbital to D orbital. So when this motion happens, you, you strongly change these charge transfer energies. So you, then the charge transfer energy B means that it's a conduction valence band difference in this case. It will will come into that. So so Thanks. that's why it's strong here. Yeah. It's kind of a unique situation. Even though you know you can have a, a transition model system, I mean it doesn't even though you have these types of Oscillation it doesn't mean the coupling was strong, so there's something unique in such a system. Why it is strong, which I don't understand. But uh, just by intuition, you're looking. You know, motion itself will directly couple to these silicon fields. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will move on. I, I will not go through these summaries actually because we have uh, about 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna go to my second topic, and uh, this is an experiment we done recently, right? It shows these uh, emerging ferromagnetism in these uh, twisted one plus two graphing systems. So it's interesting, right? Because we know graphing, you know, it's a uh, coupling atom doesn't have a strong spin of the couplings, and uh, but it, they do have valleys, right? As I show you, in the valley, what well, can have this uh, magnet, mag, mag, magnet moment, just like uh, transition metal dichotinite, right? From this barrier phase curvature. And, the other thing is coming from this orbital, you know, magnet moment. So, so we explore such opportunity in the one plus two graphings. So let me just go back to to kind of cover a little background of these twisted graphing systems. And the field is starts with twisted bilayer graphing, right? You know, as twisted bilayer graphing, when they're decoupled, you have two Dirac cones, as I show here. When you turn on the couplings, well, then the low edge band will become flat band, and uh, there's a gap from this uh, low edge band to the high edge band open, right, due to these uh, interlayer coupling, so the magic angles. And you can plot the bandwidth, which is uh, the blue line here, and uh, uh, also the, the, the electron interaction energy, the Coulomb energies as function of a trace angle, right? So, you know, within these uh, magic angle regimes, right, the Cool interaction energy actually is stronger than the bandwidth means the kinetic energy of electrons. Then people already show this pretty interesting strong correlation physics can happen, right? It can be, you know, metals, right? It can be a correlated insulator, you know, there's a sibling activity states, where there's a fair amount of order, and uh, also there's a quantum anomalous high effect. And there's a lot of a twisted system right now. It's kind of one of the hardest field. Right, starting from these twisted graphing, now people, like I told you today, we're going to show you the twisted the mono and bilayer graphings and the several groups, and starting this, actually. 
and there's a twisted, uh, you know, double, uh, transition metal dichotinized, et cetera, and so twisted double bilayer graphenes. There are also twisted uh, uh, transition metal heterobilayer system, right? The, the likely less or more to come. Okay, it's a really exciting field. <coughs> Seems somebody draw something here. Let me see if we can clean it. Okay, I will not bother. If you draw something, maybe you can just clean it by yourself. Right, this little thing here. This isn't me. So if anybody has been trying to use the annotation um, uh, tool, they should not do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll move on. So there's a, you know, uh, there's a, a gene twisted graphing system and back, back to last year, right, they would uh, go to Harvard Gordon Group. They, they found these very striking and surprising results, right? In this, uh, they found there's an emerging, you know, fair amount of order in the twisted graphing systems. They basically show these uh, anomalous high effect and with strong hysteresis. And uh, Andre Young's group take these uh, a step forward. They, they, they found actually, it's more than just fair amount of order, right? It's already indication, you know, in Davis' work, right? Indication there's, uh, there should be a, a quantum anomalous hot states. And uh, with, uh, with these uh, perfect samples, Andreas group really shows it is indeed a quantum norms how they see this. I think it's just a remarkable result, right? It's, it's a shockingly good. You, know, you see these perfect condensations in this twisted graphing system. It's a quantum norms how, right? There's just no arguments. It, it, it. And uh, uh, in addition to this twisted graphing system, from one school we've also showed these uh, very nice results of uh, uh, trilayer graphing, ABC, right? And uh, um, Born nitride from these morning patterns, and uh, they observe these uh, chains later with chain number of two, actually. So you can see there's a lot of uh, exciting topological physics you can study now with these twisted systems. So, so let me just introduce a background. You know, there's uh, already a lot of theory there. I'm not a theorist. So for those theory papers, sometimes always make me and you know, difficult, make me kind of a I have difficulty to understand them. So I always go back to my transition metal dichotinized because that's what I suddenly sort of know, you know, from, from my, my background. So in transition metal dichotinized, or just in any hexagonal like structure, we have these six divided cones, right? Now for these six divided cones, if we look at the, at the each, each divided point, and they have, can have a better curvatures, and they also can have these uh, value amount of movement, right? They all depend on these uh, value index K. So barrier curvature and also value man moment has these time reversal symmetries. So what it means is uh, if, you if you flip the valleys and the uh, better curvature, man the moment can that change the signs. And uh, on the spatial inversion symmetry, on the spatial in in symmetry operations, right? Then the barrier curvature actually and the man the moment, they are, they are, they are actually even under these uh, um, inversion operations, basically they don't change the signs. So for systems have both symmetries, then the barrier curvature and the man, very value man moment, they have to vanish, right? Because you know, they are order on the K and also even on the K, and they have to be zero. That's just uh, very simple. That's the reason why TMD can have these uh, non-vanishing barrier curvature and the value moment because, uh, right, in transition metal dichotinized the inversion symmetry breaks. Now we go to graphings. In this twisted graphing system, actually protected by these C two T symmetries. So C two is the two fold rotation symmetries. T is time reversal. So the means is uh, you know they have this inversion symmetry. Therefore, for twisted graphing system, if I just follow what I just told you, then the barrier coverage should vanish, yes? and the value main moment also should vanish. There should be no magnet magnet order, right? However, if you put the twisted graphing on hexagonal like nitro and uh, make them aligned. This is what the, you know, David Gordon, Harvard Gordon, and also Andrea Young did. They have aligned this twisted graph in Boron nitride. They break this inversion symmetry. They really break this C2T symmetry. So once you break this C2T symmetry, now we can have a net chain number associated with the net barrier curvature and the magnetic moment associated with these values, right? Here, the magnetic moment now coming from the pure orbital contributions, right? The orbital magnetic moment. And uh, magically, right, plus these uh, symmetry in strong interactions, then you can lift the degeneracy between different values. For example, when you start to dope a system, there's a possibility, for example, these uh, uh, quarter fillings, there's a one band actually has different energy than all the rest of band. When you fill the electron to this band, then you're gonna have net chain numbers. This is how they got these uh, uh, 
emergent demand order with quantum numbers high effect, right? Because there's a net chain number. When you have net chain numbers, equal to one or minus one. And then when you have a man order, then you can have a quantum numbers high effect. So now let's look at the, the system I'm going to tell you today, which is uh, uh, twisted the Mali and the Bailey graphing, right? As I show you, you know, have a Mali and put down Bailey. Then, then if we look at the band structures, a different, uh, uh, you know, potential difference with the Mali and Bailey, actually we can open a band gap, right? With flat bands, as I show you here. And uh, if you look at the momentum space, clearly, right? This uh, system breaks into T symmetries. Yeah, first it breaks C2 symmetry. We have to do these, uh, it doesn't have a, these C2 axis. And also break these mirror Y, right? If you do mirror and they don't go back to self, right? For example, from this point to this point, they're not the same point. Because one is a bilayer, one is a monolayer, right? So you break these mirror Ys and Y symmetries. So this system basically breaks C2T. So once you break C2T, well, then you, that's chance to have this uh, value matter moment, okay? So Yahui at the, uh, However, he, Yahui Zhang, he is a post at Harvard working with uh, uh, Ashwin and uh, they calculate the, the band structure in these uh, uh, model value systems. So what I show you here is uh, the, the charge density distributions, right? When the D with the displacement field across this bilayer smaller than zero, here I define the, the smaller than zero means the displacement field is pointing to from bilayer to model. So what they show you is the charge density basically distributed between these two layers, okay? The third layer is kind of redundant. Now when you turn the direction, right? Up, when you turn the D direction to opposite, now in this case it's from malaria pointing to bilayer. Now the charge distribution is go, it's distributed all these three layers, okay? And uh, the, yeah, we also calculated the, the charge distribution from twisted bilayer and also twisted double bilayer, okay? And now you compare to these two cases, you will look like, well, for twisted Mali plus bilayer system, when the D is smaller than zero, it looks just like a twisted Mali, bi, twisted bilayer graphing, right? And when D is larger than zero, actually it looks like a twisted double bilayer graphing. So you would imagine without doing these measurements, you know, a fancy way to say is one plus two actually not equal to three. Where one plus two can be equal to two, which is the equivalent to bilayer graphing, or it can be four equivalent to double or twisted double of bilayer graphing. Depends on how these, uh, the direction of this displacement field. So indeed, we, we, we verify this uh, uh, effect. So this experiment, this part is done by Xiao Wen, right, a, a graduate student of the Corey Ding. And, uh, what he show here is, uh, well, he measured these, uh, uh, here I show you the resistivity map, right, as function of displacement field and also carrier densities. And the, the electron doping side, you see, you know, for D small than zero, you see three correlated states, right, the quarter filling and the half filling, et cetera, and the three quarter filling. And then for the whole doping side, sorry, and for, for the D is larger than, than zero, we see there's a, these uh, halo kind of features. So this halo feature is a hallmark of a twisted double bilayer graphing, which is, I don't have a chance to talk to you, but we also study these and many other groups, we all show these a halo feature. So it's a hallmark of a twisted double bilayer graphing. So basically this confirms, right? We do have these uh, system behave like either twisted bilayer graphing or twisted double bilayer graphing. And, uh, <coughs> Now, when we want to switch gear, talk about these topological properties. So th there's a, already a few uh, theory work into to try to calculate what is uh, the you know the chain numbers right, and the topologies in these twisted model uh, one you know one plus two graphing systems. And the take home message is uh, right, that you 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 can't have isolated uh, uh, values with uh, net chain numbers, and uh, the chain number also depends sensitively on the twist angles and also the you know, any difference between these two layers, which can control by the gate. So basically it's a very rich systems, right? You can tune, it's possibility that's tune these, uh, you know, topological phase transition from one chain number to different chain numbers, okay? And then there with this, right, you will imagine if I have a net, we have a bands, actually bands with uh, with a chain number now is equal to zero and with uh, magnet ordering, then we can get uh, these quantum uh, numbers high effect, okay? Just like, you know, people like did in this uh, twisted uh, bilayer graphing, but aligned with boron nitride, right? So 
there's a distinction between this system to, to this twisted graphene on boron nitride system, right? In a twisted uh, graphene on boron nitride, you actually re require really careful control twist angle. First of all, you need a really careful control twist angle of graphene itself first, right? Then you need a careful line of the twisted graphene into these uh, multivariate graphene. It's a non-trivial task. I think there's only a very few samples in the world right now to realize this. And uh, also, so, well, but uh, what I claim here is uh, for this twisted one plus two graphene, right? It's automatically break all the symmetry we know. And the sample is not too hard to make. So give us the ideal situation to realize these uh, uh, ferromagnetic order and uh, topologies. So here's a measurement done by Ming Hao. And first I show you these uh, uh, resistivity map as function of displacement field and uh, as function carrier densities. So, so first of all, you, at the twist angle about 0 0.9 degree you see the correlation already really weak, where we don't see these uh, correlated states for, for D smaller than zero. And for D larger than zero, we see pretty weak correlated, correlated states. The halo feature basically, I, I show you, right, for twist double by the graphing, the hallmark is a uh, halo feature. Now, I, I, what I show you here is the halo feature actually quite weak for this particular twist angle. Now, if I just measure these uh, hall signal, and uh, as function of displacement field and uh, also these uh, feeling factors, right? Or carrier densities. Now, what the high angle I show you here, the, the high resistivity measurement I show you here is already anti-symmetric. Basically, I measure the signal as function of, uh, at the 50 minute Tesla and the minus 50 Tesla and take this anti-symmetric component. We see a pretty strong, right? Very strong hot signals at these uh, quarter feeling. So this indicates well, we may have a sphere of order in the systems. And uh, I can focus on, you know, I can park my displacement field and the carry density at this uh, point, then sweep the magnetic field back and forth. Right? We see very strong hysteresis and with very large Hall signal, right? The Hall resistance resistivity here is larger than, than 12 kilo ohm, basically. It's about the 15 kilo ohm, actually. And then you look at the, uh, so this without, you know, this is basically saying we do have a fair amount of order in these systems, okay? We're pretty competent. It's just, uh, you know, this anomalous Hall signal basically says that. And the other thing is, uh, if we look at uh, these uh, asymmetric component of these XX, is uh, it's about the kilo ohm, okay, 1.5 ish, you know, much smaller than is row x y. So this is we have a really large high angle, much larger than 10, right? I mean it's larger than 10 ish. It's about 11, 12 ish. So this shows, well, we haven't seen quantization yet, but uh, it's indication actually the system could be top topological, right? Because this is a very large enormous high effect. And uh, we can me we can measure this uh, non hot signal as function temperature, and uh, it shows right the signal will decrease as function temperature, and just uh, shows the 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 critical temperature or the Curie temperature is on the order of uh, close to two Kelvin. So again, right, we're not the only one doing this, and the Andrea at the uh, Andrea Young group, they also did these measurements at the twist angle is slightly different, one point two five. So they show pretty remarkable signal actually. They, for example, at these uh, uh, either quarter filling or three quarter filling, they observe this anomalous hot signal. So what's remarkable here is uh, this hot signal is almost half quantized. So it indicates it is, is, it is a topological right, non-trivial system with chain number of two, okay? But the, what I want to say is that our signal is slightly different from his because the, the whole signal we saw is already larger than half condensation. So, so it means that a chain number might not be two. And the, even the signal is beautiful, what you see in Andrea's data. But there's one thing which is still puzzling to me is that, right here I show you is a resistivity map. Okay. And he see strong resistivity at these quarter feeling and three quarter feeling. However, but the system is also quantized, right? When you see the quantized the hot signal, it means RXY should go to zero, right? That's what he shows here. The RXX, sorry, the RXY is a half quantized. Then it means there's a carrier edge states, right? Then you measure RXX should go to zero. That's what they show here. But however, if you go to zero, how come you also see these resistivity states here showing up clearly, right? 
So there's something I, I haven't asked Andrea, but there's there's a kind of puzzling feature here. Basically, he shows pretty strong resistivity states at the quarter feeding and three quarter feeding, but also show pretty beautiful condensation signal with uh, vanishing RxX. So there's something puzzling here. I haven't fully understood. Yeah. But I'm sure Andrea has an has a explanation for that. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, you know, in, in addition to this uh, firm and the other, we see this last part, okay, we're almost done, is uh, we saw something kind of remarkable is how we can switch these uh, uh, magnetization as function of uh, doping, particularly as function of my sweeping directions. So first I fix my magnetic field of five Tesla, five milli Tesla, and that sweep magnetic field, you know, these uh, carrier dopings, right, either from, or feeding factor, either from high feeding factor to low feeding or from low feeding to high feeding. So when I'm field is a five milli Tesla or minus five milli Tesla, you can see the house signal, well, it doesn't change the sign, but the sign of house signal basically determined by magnetic, by magnetic field directions. Make sense? But if I fix my magnetic field to zero, okay? Now I sweep my feeling factor, you will see the house signal actually switch signs. This is kind of very interesting, right? Basically by, changing the sweeping directions, actually, I can switch the magnetic or the house signal. In this case means I switch the magnetization directions. That's impressive, actually, I will say, because there's no other system can do this. At the same time, we don't understand what's going on. And we only see it, you know, in these particular samples, we haven't really repeating a different sample. So you should take it, you know, this information carefully. I mean, we saw it, it's real. But then I'm not sure if we can repeat it. But again, at least I will tell you it's an interesting signals. And then we can sweep these as function, but you know, we also measure this hot signal by sweeping the displacement field and we don't see the sign switching of the hot signal. So this sign switching only happen when we sweep in the direction of feeling factors, okay? And only near magnetic field equal to zero because when the magnetic field is large, the, the sign of a hot signal is determined by the magnetic field directions. So what's going on here? We don't know what's going on, but at least we can rule out something, right? First of all, I can measure this uh, 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 hot signal as function of a sweeping direction at the fixed magnetic field, okay? You know, from zero to small fixed field and uh, at the large field. Uh, clearly, when the magnetic field is large, well, the hot signal is determined by the magnetic field directions. So this kind of a little bit of anisotropy here. This anisotropy is only order of a couple of milli Tesla. It's small, all right? The second, you know, I can do these initialization measurements by my field. So I here show what I do here. Uh, it's kind of complicated if you don't do experiments. And uh, but let me just go slowly to walk you through what I did here. So first, I fix my feeling factor at the 0.94. That's what I did. This this line means right. It's constant. Then I sweep my field from 50 milli Tesla all the way back to zero. So what the means is. If you follow this, uh, you know, his research curve, what it means is I starting with this point and the sweep magnetic field back all the way from 50 milli Tesla to zero Tesla. So now I initialize my system at this point. So this is my initial, my, my initial condition, right? This is my hot signal to begin with at this point. Next, I'm gonna sweep my feeling factor to 2.5 and then back to this 0.94, okay? But this, the magnetic field is fixed at zero. After that, now I start to, I, I fix my feeling factor. It doesn't change anymore. All I'm gonna do is start to sweep magnetic field. So from zero back to 50. So this, what this blue line means, right? The blue line is corresponding to this blue here. So this shows, tells me my RXY is actually end up uh, to begin, you know, in this point. Then sweep magnetic field back and forth, everything just repeat, right? Now I'm gonna do a different measurements. Yes, I'm gonna start my magnetic field to minus 50 milli Tesla, then sweep back to zero. So what that means is I'm gonna initialize my system to this point, actually, exactly opposite to this process in P1, right? In the P1, you know, what I show you, is starting from this point, but the P2 is the system starting from this point, okay? But then if I do sweeping my, my mu, my feeling factor again, you will see these two process, P1, P2, it's exactly the same. So it means, has nothing to do with my initial condition, either at this point, which hot signal is larger than zero, or this point when hot signal is smaller than zero. Doesn't care. What only matters is my sweeping directions, okay? You know, my sweeping of this mu, right? 
is mu determines the, hot sign, the sign of a hot signal. So I can go to a different process called P3. In this case, initialization condition is the same as P1, but the difference is now I sweep my viewing factor is go to negative first, then go back to 0.94. So it means the starting point is this is same as P1. But then if I, if I right, <coughs> So, but if I sweep my feeling factor again, you know, after I, a initial condition, you will see the signal actually starts from negative, right? So now you can tell, even though P1 and P3 has the same initial condition, but because the feeling factor sweeping in opposite directions, then the house signal is exactly opposite, okay? So I can go to P4, will be, will be, this is another condition similar to P2, but they have opposite signs, okay? So, what I can tell you is the sign of magnetization actually has nothing to do with my initialization conditions. They're only determined by the feeling factor sweeping directions. Why this? I don't know. Maybe Justin can help us you know, once you start to think about it. Let's talk. Yeah. All right. So again, let's talk about Andreas' data. Right? He also saw these uh, uh, sign switching of these hot signal, but it's different from ours. Right? You can see what he saw here. It's beautiful signal. But what he sees is actually you need a magnetic field. So you, you fix your magnetic field, then you're sweeping your, your doping directions. Now you can see the hot signal switching signs, but the exact opposite to what we saw, right? What we saw is when the magnetic field is fixed, the hot signal, the sign of hot signal will be fixed. But only at the zero field, the hot signal, the sign of the hot signal will switch in our case. But in Andrea's case, you need a magnetic field. Then you're sweeping the, the, the feeling factors, then, then the hot signal will change the signs. So there's something different from his system to our system, okay? All right, so that's the end. You know, I show you, right? This one plus two system is actually a highly tunable platform to investigate a, a broad array of tunable correlated and then also topology states, right? It's basically a, approximately resembles either twisted bilayer or twisted double bilayer graphing and has a tunable ferromagnetic order with a normal signal with possible change of the state. With that, right, you know, here's the guys doing the work, and uh, here's my group, and I'd like to acknowledge the, the, the funding support, and uh, thank you for your attention. Right, so thanks very much. Um, uh, so, uh, are there questions? Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, I can start with one, one simple quick question. So, so th there was a very curious, very sharp um, feature for your exotonic peak at the very, very start yeah. of your, do you, do, you, do you have an explanation for why it's so sharp? Like why is it 350 micro EV? You know, line width? Yeah, first of all, what means the material is clean, right? If you have a lot of disorder, definitely will burn the line width. And the other thing is, uh, you know, when you say what this line width means, right? Line width is usually is uh, determined by, you know, the coherence of the exotonic systems. That's what the PO language means, defacing time, basically. And the defacing time determined by two things, right? If one is a pure defacing. Pure defacing is, a, is a related to the energy relaxation. The other is, a, the other is a, you know, actual defacing due to interactions between, for example, with the environment. So, so what that means, this system basically is quiet. Why it's quiet, right? You can think of because all my spin is a strongly ordered, okay? They, they like armies, right? All, all the guys, they, they start, they talk to each other from some ordered state where right? all the spin is zigzag ordered, okay? So when you have these strongly, you know, with these uh, ordered states and the time is coming from these ordered parameter, I would think that's one reason, right? You can think of it as a very quiet environment. So the language can be narrow. And the other feature is when we increase the temperature, right? As I show you, when you're above 100 Kelvin, language is actually broaden dramatically. So of course there can be thermal broadening, you know, due to phonon interaction. But there's another indication is that when I go up high temperature, the spin fluctuation become pretty strong, especially close to this neo temperature, right? That's when the spin fluctuation become most dramatic. So that's another indication, you know, the language has something to do with the, this magnetic order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so actually I have a, a question with in relation to, to that answer. So, so, so um, when you measure your PL, um, one can measure PL um, coming straight away 
kind of normal incident to, um, to, to, to a plane. But one can also try to change your detector direction and see the, the kind of uh, angular distribution of this photoluminescence. So it turns out, depending on the type of exciton that you are looking at, the, the, the PL can sometimes be, um, uh, be, be going perpendicular. Yeah, I know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah on the side. So, so in, in your case, what happens for this very sharp, sharp, uh, sharp feature? Is it, is it completely isotropic in all directions or is it very kind of um, anisotropic in its emission? So we haven't done the measurements, which is the same plane propagation. We just haven't done that. So I cannot address this question. Okay. So all we did is, uh, is a vertical detection of the emissions. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, but the other to say is I'm not sure if the, the system has out-plane dipole, basically. At least it has in-plane dipole for sure, because I see these signals. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. More questions? Uh, hey, hey, Justin, can I ask a of question? Of course. Please, please. Please ask questions. Yeah. Hey, Sheldon, it's me. Yeah, yeah, I know it's you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> your, your work is is a beautiful, and you you looks great. Uh, is it safe for you? Because I think there's a really midnight at your side, right? I mean, the, you 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 need to drive back home, or you're yeah, yeah, to yeah. Work, you're going to yeah. work overnight in your office. It, it could be option. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, but I I get a question about your first part. Yeah. Uh, you you showed a very strong evidence of the coupling between that exciton and the phonons, right? We see those uh, replicas here. That's right. And, yeah. Yeah. Did you look at the, the just a direct the Raman and see whether there is uh, some phonon feature or Raman mode, especially near the new temperature? Since you have conducted the polarization measurement as well, whether we can get some let's see, relatively direct information from the Raman spectrum to see, oh, that is the mode highly involved with this uh, ordering of this uh, anti ferromagnet Yeah, that's very good questions. So basically there's a mode which is a, a strong couple of three man order. It's called, I, I don't remember exactly which mode now, you know, one of the three, I think it's this mode actually. Uh -huh. So so what the people did is, uh, yeah, that's the mode that I, I, I'm, I think it's this mode. Anyway, this is the mode I'm looking at, the, which is a, we identify couple to my exotome. So, so there's another, there's a mode, I'm not exactly remember now, it's this mode or that mode, but there's a one mode, if you look at the, the energy difference of this mode. So this mode can have a two peaks, I think it's this mode. There's energy, when you measure polarization, there's a two peaks. And you can measure the energy difference of these two peaks and it can track this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this transition. plane magnetic susceptibility difference. Yeah. Okay, I see, I see that. So, 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 so that's one mode, so, so here, yeah. Okay, me, great, great. Me, it's this guy. So they measure the energy difference called P2. I just don't remember what they mean P2 here. You know, they measure the energy <laughs> difference. So in this paper, what they show you is the energy difference of this mode that's falling temperature has this mm -hmm. uh, right, phenomena, has these temperature okay. dependence. Yeah, so yeah. what I found is actually we did these same measurements. This, and uh, then basically in that paper, they say the, you know, this mode is a measure of a man order, but they don't tell you where it's coming from. So what we did is we mapped the mode and we, and then we compare these in-plane magnetizability and the such piece. What we found is that the, and the difference of the mode is exactly matched this, perfectly matched actually, perfect. So this tells me the energy difference of the, the particular mode is coming from in-plane magnetic accessibility and the such piece. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. a better measurements than my degree of polarization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question about the second part that that's uh, magic yeah. angle things. Yeah. Uh, well, did you try Raman? You see the, the Raman- the Excellent graphic, questions. Yeah, Excellent it's, question. it's, yeah. It's, it's always very strong. It's, a, it's a kind of like a resonance. I understand that uh, the periodic structure of a uh, uh, super lattice could be very small or it's over small for the micron Raman. But you get any updates, let's say Raman can, can play some roles in, in this topic? Yeah, definitely, for sure. So the simple thing is when you have Raman and uh, you have more phonons, right? So, yeah. So, and the, the question is uh, when there's a, uh, when all these colorless states form, you know, for example, either mass states or similar activities or magnet orders, right? How these uh, other parameters are gonna change these more phonons? It's not known. Or the other thing is, uh, is any phonon can probe these other parameters, which is not known. 
it so has not been studied. There's a reason why it's not being studied because uh, all the feature I'm talking to you right, needs a pretty low temperature. For example, like superman activity, you need a below one Kelvin. Mm. For this experiment order I told you today, you know, at least for the sample we have, also Neo needs temperature below one Kelvin. So, so uh, the 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 short thing, short story is uh, most people, most groups they study this, they don't do optics, right? And the most people do optics, they don't have these samples. And even if you have these samples, the sample also requires pretty low temperatures. Exactly, exactly. exactly. That's so, the sound sound situation we have. So there's, <laughs> a, there's yeah, there's a there's a technical challenge there for how to get a good sample for optical study. Yeah, that's something yeah. actually we're working on right now, trying to get a good sample for for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Very good. Thank you, Xiaodong. Yeah. Take care. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Xiaodong. This is Chihua. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. I have a question on your first part. So when you see this uh, strong exciton phonon coupling, you show as the spectrum, uh, I mean, the, the linear dichlorism spectrum, mainly at a high energy side, you see these uh, small peaks. So I yeah. wonder if you see that, um, uh, reflectivity spectrum at the lower energy side? Yeah, so at lower energy side, we don't see this. You do not see that? Yeah, we don't, no, we don't see it. I see. So is that possible um, to somehow measure the the coupling? It's just like a Stokes and the anti Stokes. Uh, That's a good question. So, so for external phone and bound state, it always show up in the high energy, high energy side because it's a bound state. It's a, it, it's always go to high energies. It's cool. okay. Yeah, the reason is you add a phonon energy into it, right? For example, mm. this is my exciton. Then you add a one phonon, you add two phonons, you add three phonons, right? So the energy will mm. be larger than the exciton. So that's exciton phonon bound state. You always show mm -hmm. up with high energy. You don't see them at low energy. But okay. if you look at luminescence, there's a possibility to see you know phonon replica in the luminescence. Yeah. Okay. So that 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 that's an interesting question. We do see some signature of that. And but the but the, the the spectrum is a little bit like too complicated. I cannot say for sure which mode involved actually. Mm. And the, the the other thing is uh is uh well, as I show you, you now the exciton is indirect. When it's indirect the town, mm. when you emit light, you need a phonon to help anyway. The first place, right? So mm. when you involve a phonon to help you know, the the emission, then 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 how the other you know how the phonon replica come into play is also a very complicated questions. Yeah. Basically, okay. you need multiple phonons, right? You know, one phonon mm -hmm. is help you to scatter into light cones. Then, then you involve other phonons to perform replica. It's always a complicated question. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. More questions from from maybe students, postdocs. So we seem to have one. So, uh, Baudi, would you? Baudi, you're unmuted. So if you want to, if, if you want to ask a question, you can. Can me now? Yes, please. Yes, please ask, ask your question. So I have a question, uh, the professor. Should, uh, did you try the near resonance measurement for this material? Yeah, so that's what it is, right? This case. Uh, if you, I'm wondering if you use a like a new resonance excitation, can you see some like some uh, resonance Raman things? Yeah, we haven't studied resonance Raman. That's because that's a little bit difficult. If you think about you want to resonance Raman, you need uh, you need a good filter at the you know at the this laser energy, right? Oh, Which is difficult. You, yeah. I mean, the filters yeah. always at the fixed wavelengths, right? Yeah. Like I mean, if you use a laser like. Uh, above your band gap, like a uh, several phonon, you said, uh, several phonon energy that like you observe here. Mm -hmm. Can you see some like, uh, oh, I would call hot exciton luminescence things? Yeah, actually, we we tried that. We didn't see that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so I have a very kind of trivial question. So, 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 so about these uh, wiggles that you see in your um, phosphate um, yeah. um, samples. Um, so just because you have an exciton phonon bound state, you know, just so, so this, this, this will mean um, um, your 32 MeV is not really 32 MeV, it's now 28 MeV. 
how does this explain having multiple wiggles? So I would typically think that, okay, I can maybe excite one phone on sideband, but each time I go to higher and higher phone on sidebands, um, I, I, I might think that, you know, um, the coupling should, should, should reduce by an energy denominator. So, so, yeah, so how, how do you sense. try, so, so how do you explain so many, you see, I, I, how many wiggles you see? Five, six, maybe seven yeah. wiggles. Yeah. So how do you get, so is it, is it super strong coupling at this point or something? Like what's the. That's what exactly you're asking during my talk, right? I, I, what yeah. I can tell you is, uh, is uh, it's basically the, it indicates, you know, this coupling strongly modif modified these uh, lithium field transitions. I see. So, so. And why it's so strong? You, it's a different story. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. It's something probably less a unique material property here. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. You can think of a, because we don't see this feature in other transition metal triphosides. Trifos I mean, yeah, this is the only one we see with these beautiful phonon replicas. Okay. And only just in the LD as well. And it's not, it's, it's nothing else. You can't see this for, for example, reflectance or. No, you don't see them reflectance, right? That's what the other people did, you know, yeah. like I show you. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. The reason yeah. LD because they give me the sensitivities. I see. You can think of it, subtract the background, right? The I only see. left over is the NSHP. Yeah. And so this probably means that, you know, that phonon is most, um, it's most sensitive to the anisotropy, right? So exactly. between, between yeah. this and this. Yeah. So it probably tells you the direction of that phonon as well. Some kind of No, it just or... means that it's coupled to this in many order. I see. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I see. I see. Okay. More questions? I see. So if there if there are no more questions, it's it's probably quite late for um for for Xiaodong. Um, let's um thank him again um uh for this uh, very very interesting talk. Well, and thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah Xiaodong, thank you so much. Thank you. Well. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to see you guys, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll close the the session. You can leave now. I I'll I'll, I'll basically stay okay. on till till uh, till till everyone leaves. Okay. Uh. Well. See you guys. Okay. Thank see you, Shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Take you care. so much. Bye. Bye. Justin.